Welcome in to the PFF Podcast. Steve Palazzolo here along with Mike Renner. And before we dive into today's topics, I want to tell you guys about a great fantasy football game that we have. It's called Draft, and you can find it in the App Store. Just search Draft. It's also at PlayDraft.com. It is a completely new concept, uses real money. You guys, you can get in there for a $3 game, a $10 game, a $25 game, and you can win actual money. It's called best ball, best ball format. So you pick your team and then every week you don't even have to worry about setting your roster, making trades, waiver wire injuries. You don't have to. You set your team, set it and forget it all season long. It's going to take your best players every single week and you have a chance to win actual money. It's really fantastic. I tried it today. Couple different ways to draft. You can do the fast draft if you're low on time, takes under an hour, fly through your draft, or you could do a slow draft, which you have about eight hours to pick, so you don't always have to check back in. You can kind of take your time, do it during work if you need to, but really a fantastic concept. It's over at playdraft.com or draft in the App Store, and for a limited time only, all new players will get a free entry into a $3 best ball draft when you make your first deposit all you have to do is use the promo code PFF. That's right. Play a real money game for free just using our promo code PFF on your first deposit on draft. Search draft in the app store or go to playdraft.com and come play for free with promo code PFF. And Mike, I did the fast draft earlier today. I heard you're doing a, a slow draft. Aren't you on the clock right now? Yeah, I'm literally on the clock as we speak. I have I have Aaron Rodgers, I have Melvin Gordon, and I'm deciding right now between Marshawn Lynch and Isaiah Crowell. I think I'm going to go Isaiah Crowell. I think we, we talked about this. We talked about me thinking Marshawn's not going to get the touches, so I'll go Crowell. I actually drafted Marshawn earlier on, in my in my oh, league. You're, just hoping. You messed up. <laughs> well, I went, I'm going high upside. I'm trying to win here. So I'm just like, what's the best case scenario for all of these guys? Because it's a best ball league, you want those those high upside guys, Mike. That's Steve, that Brown's O-line, though. Come on. They do have a good O-line with Come Crowell. I, I wish we could take it to Twitter. You do have eight hours to get through this. but Were look, you saying I, upside there just to try and like goad me also? No, you can use upside. That was the I was gonna say that was the right usage. So you, you can know. use upside in fantasy football. So guys, go check it out. Promo code PFF, playdraft.com or draft in the app store. Let's get into today's topics. We're talking training camp, we're talking preseason, really just preseason storylines, Mike. You know, what are we looking for? Every year I think I go into the preseason and you know, if you're presented with that first Thursday night of games and that Friday night of games and it's like where are you gonna put your attention? That's how I always view the preseason. If I had to, you know, look at two or three specific things that I'm going to focus on, what are they? So I'm going to let you start. We're going to go back and forth and say, what are you looking forward to? What am I looking forward to? Because preseason can be very telling. It, not necessarily the wins and losses, but new players, new systems, new coaches. So you kick it off. What are you most looking forward to seeing during the preseason? I, I think my favorite storyline and what I want to watch the most is probably how just the youth talent on the Cleveland Browns looks like. What are, are these guys going to be, you know, stars? There's a lot of guys that we were high on coming out in the draft process. Uh, are they going to turn into who we thought they were? They have all these picks. They have. So here, here are the guys in their first or second year in the league for the Browns that will be getting some serious playing time this year. Corey Coleman, Rashard Higgins, David Njoku, Sean Coleman, Cody Kessler. That's just on offense. Miles Garrett, Emmanuel Ogba, Carl Nassib, Joe Schobert, Jabril Peppers. That's defense. That's 10 guys in their first or second year of the NFL who are going to be playing a huge role for this team. So if that if those guys, you know, come to fruition, this team could, you know, they could easily be a an above 500 team if all if they're hitting on all these guys. But that's the thing. It's what are they going to look like in the preseason? Are they going to look like hits, uh, you know, in these first few weeks? Yeah, I, th I agree there with the Browns. I mean, on paper, if you are going to rebuild a team, you do it through the draft and you do it through high volume drafting. So I think as far as the strategy goes, I know people love to make fun of the Browns and yeah, they've made some poor decisions through the years and, and all that. But understatement. Understatement, absolutely. But when you draft <laughs> high volume, when you grab 14 players two years ago and then 10 this year in 2017 and you still have big draft draft capital for next year. I mean, that's the blueprint, right? So you don't have to hit on 14 picks. You know, you, you can hit on five out of 14. You can hit 
36. You could hit 357 and still have a pretty good draft. Where, yeah, that's know, the thing. That's they had three first rounders here. Only hitting on one of them is more than most teams do on first rounders. You know, just hitting on one. So if they hit on Miles Garrett or if they hit on David Njoku, whatever, like if they can just hit on one of those, they're doing better than most people do in the first round because most pe- teams only have one pick. So, yeah, I, I really think, though, a lot of these guys could – I really think this team is due for a big bump in the win total column just because of that. And then you also look at the fact that they're adding other new starters and Jason McCourty, maybe Calvin Pryor, Kevin Zeitler, JC Treader, Kenny Britt. This is just a complete overhaul of this roster. And yeah, they sucked last year. There's no debating that. But when you look at how many new players there are there, we really don't know what this team is going to look like. It could be a good team, which is you know, interesting to see. Yeah, and even when I'm watching these guys, I'm less interested in what they're going to do this year. It's still about oh, if I know, these yeah. guys show well, it's about three, four years down the road here for the Browns. The other part of it, you mentioned you know, there's low risk. They had three first-rounders, and then their fourth pick last year was Deshaun Kaiser, the quarterback. And we'll be talking about the rookie quarterbacks in a few minutes, but I keep looking at Deshaun Kaiser, even though he's a second-round pick, as a very low-risk option because he was their fourth pick. If he fails or if he just... Um, you know, doesn't do it or whatever, they still have these other three first-round picks, and they're still in the market for a quarterback next year if they're picking in the top 10 once again. So uh, I'm with you, man. The Browns are in position to potentially make a move. Their 2016 class in particular, people joked that they were just looking at the PFF draft guide and picking right down our draft Mm -hmm. board because they had so many guys that we loved. So it's a big year for them. It's a big year for us to see how those guys who are really, really productive in college. Yeah, that's uh, the thing can, I didn't really want be... to. Uh, yeah, that's the that was the underlying element that I didn't want to pump too much. But yeah, they uh, they lined up a lot with our draft board, so it would it would help it would behoove us for them to be good as well. Yeah, and we don't have any inside info. It's not like I was sitting there in the draft room with these guys helping them. It just happened to be. Oh, oh you didn't get the invite, Steve? I didn't get the. Were you there? Shoot. Well, I can't tell. <laughs> I was covering the draft that night, man. But but Joe Schobert, a Mike Renner favorite, a guy like that going in the oh, fourth yeah. round where everyone else is like, oh, yeah, who's this undersized outside backer? And you're like, no, Joe Schobert, he's oh, a guy. Wait. He's a top 40 guy in Mike's world. So That's a top 40 guy. That's who you really want to watch. You really want to watch Schobert. I know that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I have very – I have a lot tied to him. I, I had – oh, I should have gone back and looked at my list of my guys from last year. He was one of them. But like all my other ones were fairly spot on in terms of who I had. Guys like Chris Jones, Jordan Howard were my guys last year. One of them was Joe Schobert. So uh, make me look good, Joe. Make you look good. And then Rashard Higgins, the fifth round wide receiver, you did mention Sam's guy. That's one of Sam's guys. Sam made the Isaac Bruce comparison to Rashard Higgins. I don't know if Sam was drunk that night, but he really, really liked watching Higgins. And he is he's he's a pretty nifty route runner. So I, I see I see what he was saying, but. Let's go to my – it's my turn now. What am I looking forward to in the preseason? For me, the biggest thing, I'm going to be watching the Carolina Panthers on offense because Cam Newton, they they say that they're going to change the offense. They're going to make things easier for Cam Newton. Um, I don't know exactly what that means. Does that mean quick passing game? Does that mean more running? I don't know exactly what it means, but then you, you get to the draft and you see that they draft Christian McCaffrey out of Stanford in the first round, Curtis Samuel out of Ohio State in the second round. Both guys who are, they're both running backs by name. Samuels, maybe even just a wide receiver by name. He's He was pretty much a 50-50 wide receiver slash running back at Ohio State. They're guys that can line up in the slot. They're mismatch type of guys. They're good catching the ball out of the backfield. So it looks like on paper, instead of getting these big six foot six receivers who can't separate all that well, they're trying to get these shorter guys that can create mismatches and really focus on the quick pass game, the short pass game. My concern is, that's not really Cam Newton's game. That is not. So I want to see if that's what they're really trying to do, because then it's going to be like, I think it's going to be like putting a you know square peg, round hole type of thing with Cam trying to run that offense. That is a very good one. I, I, in terms of all the offenses in the NFL that I want to see what they do this year, and you know schematically, I think that is the most interesting to me because of what they could do, but yet – you know, is that really the best thing to do with the talent they have? McCaffrey and Samuel, incredibly dynamic, but it's like you mentioned, that's more short area stuff. That's more slants. That's not, you're not running a go route on a wheel out of the back. I mean, sometimes you are, but that's not, uh, that's not where they probably are going to be best at. So where, and like you said, Cam Newton does not win in the short area game. He wins down the field, uh, you know, in that sort of range. So, 
it, it just will be interesting to see how you know Mike Shula meshes it all together. If they hadn't said we're trying to protect Cam Newton because he does take a lot of hits, and we know the story about him taking you know hits that aren't called as roughing the passers, things like that. If they hadn't mentioned that part of it, and then I saw this draft, I would have said, okay, for the run game, this is fascinating. Because you already know that Cam's a run threat, not so much not so much a scrambler, but a design run threat. He always has been, and they've used him in that capacity. Now you're talking if if they're talking run game, you 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 could put McCaffrey next to him. You can have Samuel running jet sweeps all all over the Ooh. place. Now we're talking. It looks like a college offense, but that's not really protecting Cam Newton. But if they if they incorporate elements of that and just the threat of Cam as a because you still have to respect the Alabama him. stuff. Yeah, you, you have to respect him as a run threat. Now you're talking Samuel, McCaffrey. Now you're moving them around, jet sweep stuff and shovel stuff. If they incorporate some of that, that part of it makes sense to me. But if they're like, Cam, I want you to drop back and pick teams apart, short passing game like your Tom Brady, Phillip Rivers, or you know someone else that's you know really accurate in that short range, that part of it I don't think really matches. This, this is really interesting. The Panthers could challenge one of my hot takes in the past i'm not sure which podcast it was that i gave it but i said that the jet sweep and jet sweep motion is the next big thing in the nfl if you go watch someone like alabama in college they'll run it you know like almost 30 to 40 percent of their plays uh there's a jet sweep sort of motion because of what it does to you know so many defenders on the field have to account for that that player who's in motion at the snap right uh and I just think they and they now have the personnel there in Carolina to run that effectively with Curtis Samuel with a run threat quarterback like Cam Newton. So they could they could be the one to do it. They could be the one to prove my theory right that it's the next big thing because I, I really do think that there are so many benefits to it, especially when you have someone with the speed like Samuel who can play out the slot. Now you're rooting for this. Now you're rooting for them to make Jet your hot motion. take look good. Jet sweep motion. Uh, let me just finish it with a number. We've been charting the NFL quarterback's actual ball location on each throw. Did you put it on? Did you put it right on him in stride? Did you leave it a little bit behind? So actual ball location in that charting out of 24 quarterbacks that are done on every single throw, Cam Newton is dead last, uh, actually <sighs> second to last oh, no. on one to five yard throws. We're talking. So it's not so much completing passes, but at least putting them in the right spot. And so if you're trying to maximize Christian McCaffrey and Curtis Samuel in the short pass game, you run that little five yard out, you need to put it either on his numbers or on that front number so they can catch and run. Cam, not only does he just straight miss a lot of those throws, you know, they're too high so you can't get a catch and run opportunity or it's on the back hip instead of the front. It's just not his game. Dead last. or He's just behind Jared Goff. So Goff, smaller sample size, but Cam was second to last in one to five yard accuracy. His behind the line of scrimmage accuracy was third worst. And that's just, that's swing passes, that's screens. Again, that's all the stuff that these guys might be catching. So uh, not the best short area quarterback for catch and run opportunities. Mike, what else are you looking forward to seeing this preseason? Well, I just said that the Panthers were the you know first offense that I'm looking at schematically in terms of what they're going to do this year. The mo- one I'm most excited for, the one I'm second most excited for would be San Francisco's Kyle Shanahan. I've made my <laughs> love for his play calling uh not a secret over the years i'm a big fan of what he does offensively and basically what it how it applies to brian hoyer because back in 2014 when they were together before he had a seven game stretch brian hoyer where if he had the you know os weilerian uh luck to only have that stretch on tape over his entire career he would have gotten paid like osweiler and then some because he had seven game stretch there in Cleveland, where he had averaged 8.7 yards per attempt, had a two to one touchdown to interception ratio with not really a lot of talent around him and looked like he could have been a franchise quarterback. People were talking about him as if, oh, did they find, you know, where this diamond in the rough from, you know, the Patriots backup quarterback, the, that machine there. But wheels fell off uh, a little bit. <laughs> and by a little bit, I mean a lot. I mean, uh, Brian Hoyer just tanked then after that. But then again, this past season in Chicago, we touched on it on the uh, quarterback battles podcast he was good again in this time he was legitimately looked good in some games now the wheels always seem to fall off with him but maybe maybe he can recapture something maybe he can do something there's not a lot of talent on the san francisco offense i get that but if anyone can get something out of brian hoyer i think it's kyle shanahan so i'm excited to see if 
he looks, you know, like a competent quarterback, at least this preseason. You are the guy that's excited to watch the 49ers offense. This I was going to say, like, uh, we lost a lot of listeners there. Like, is that actually what he's second most excited about, the 49ers offense? Yeah, that's what... Uh, Out of all 32 my- teams, you really want to see that 49ers offense. I, I love the point that you make about Osweiler. You know, if, if Osweiler or if Hoyer just had first see, uh, first half of the season on tape, people would think he's really good. Unfortunately, he's played in the second half before our guy Sam has come up with the outstanding number if you look at his passer rating it's something like 90 in the first half of the season and then after week eight all of a sudden it's like 72 throughout his career I forget the exact number he's said it on the podcast before I used to make that excuse when I pitched I pitched two good innings and then if they put me out there for a third and I gave up four runs it's like well you guys should have just taken me out I would have been great would have been a great outing but it doesn't work that way I think Brian Hoyer is still Brian Hoyer uh, you're right though last season he looked pretty good took care of the football ran that Chicago offense pretty well. Um, I, I do want to see what Kyle Shanahan does, you know, as far as schematically, if he does just completely incorporate his system. But I think the bigger story with the 49ers is that, you know, he's a holdover, uh, or he's a, he's a bridge guy. They're going to be looking for a quarterback next season. You know, it, then it's a matter of, you know, is Pierre Garçon, a guy like him, going to be a part of their rebuild? Uh, is a guy like Joe Williams, who... Kyle Shanahan really went to bat for in the draft. They got him in the fourth round, and they, you know, Kyle Shanahan said, we need this guy. You know, Is he going to emerge as, as this big play threat for them because he has uh, unbelievable speed? I think those are the stories for the Niners in that new scheme, but it's really about what's their future going to look like beyond your boy Brian Hoyer. Yeah, uh, I'm just picturing right now Brian Hoyer throwing an interception late in the season, coming back to the bench and saying, well, you know, it was December. You should have taken me out. Well, game. that's your fault. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Shani, you know the numbers. You know I'm not. You know I can't do that. The Joe Williams thing is interesting, actually, because of what Kyle Shanahan just said in a press conference earlier this week, or actually it was probably over the weekend, uh, about how motioning to empty, what that does, you know, taking your running back out of the backfield and putting him in the slot and going to an empty set, what the defense, how would they have to react and how quickly, you know, how, how little time they have to react. We saw them do that with Tevin Coleman against the Broncos up the seam and score yeah. a touchdown with that. Because if you have a running back who runs a 4-3 like Williams does and you put him on a linebacker, it doesn't you don't have to be a great route runner at that point. You just have to run in a straight line and you should be able to create separation. So that, that is interesting. Uh, I think he said what do you say uh, over the weekend? He's talked about how the linebacker has to switch with the safety or immediately right. with a pre-call, pre-snap call, whatever. But he used motion more than any other coach in the NFL last year, the Atlanta Falcons did. So they'll definitely be part of their offense there in San Fran. Great stat for Disco. you, Mike. And look, the more the more we watch, you know, we've been doing this for a while now. I, you, you look at defensively, if you're a defense that just doesn't bust coverages, that just keeps the ball in front of you, you're going to do okay. It's when you when you bust when you have busted coverages and you give up those big plays. That's what motion does to you. And nobody exploited opposing defenses as well as Kyle Shanahan last year. Whether it was you know busted coverage against Seattle for a huge touchdown. You mentioned Denver. And as much credit as Matt Ryan got last year, and he played really well, but he's played really well every single year. Last year the difference was there were scheme plays. Whether it was screens, whether it was busted coverage, there were scre- there were scheme plays that made him look that much better statistically so I, I do think Kyle Shanahan was a huge part of that agree all right what's your next one Steve my number two um I'm looking at the staying with quarterbacks of course I'll talk defense in a minute but you can't, the, the you can't rookie, get away from them I can't the rookie quarterbacks we broke them down in the training camp battles we went in depth I suggest you guys go listen to the episode we had Zach Robinson on my partner on the Big Time Throwcast, Mike, which people hey, also nice need plug. to subscribe to. How's that plug right there? Big yeah. Time Throwcast. Go check it out. But we broke them down in depth. But here's what I want to see from the rookie quarterbacks. You have Deshaun Watson in Houston. You have Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. Those are two teams. They were playoff teams last year. They should be in the playoff picture this year. Uh, I'm not including Deshaun Kaiser of the Browns. Uh, I'm not including Mitch Trubisky of the Bears because maybe, you Mitchell. know, they might not be in the playoff picture. But I want to know what these guys all look like immediately. I just want to see first impressions because it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have a good or bad career. But just like last year, first, what was your first impression of Dak Prescott versus Jared Goff, say? That first no, that w- I mean, it really was. I didn't want to. It was night and day. It was tough. It was tough to, like, you know, get on board real quick just because, like you said, it is preseason. But 
it it held true throughout the whole season. Basically, how they pre- played in the preseason, their respective you know levels of play, right, was exactly how they played in the regular season, which was wild. So I, I just want to see comfort level. You know, like if Deshaun Watson rolls out there week one or week two, and he just looks really comfortable running that Houston offense, then that might that's going to bode well for them. You know, with that type of defense, they're going to be in every game. You know, they could actually make a move. If Patrick Mahomes comes out and he just looks comfortable running the Kansas City offense and he's making plays and just looks like he belongs, I think they're going to have a serious decision to make at some point during the season. Again, we talked about it on the training camp battles. Is he going to be the guy that slides in and takes Alex Smith's job in week eight, week 10, or something down the stretch where he could be this spark for that offense, you know, going on a playoff run? So I, I want to see what they look like. Whereas, you know, Dak looked really comfortable last year, week one. Jared Goff looked a little overwhelmed, and both of those initial impressions certainly held true throughout the whole season. I do like the comfort level thing, looking at that, because while being comfortable doesn't necessarily mean you'll be successful, I think looking uncomfortable, looking like Jared Goff did, is a very bad sign. That means right. you are in for some trouble your rookie season. So uh, it's not a necessary predictor of success. It's definitely if you're on the wrong side of that, you are you're going to have an uphill climb. Yep, that's exactly what it is. So I want to see those rookies, want to see those quarterbacks, because I do think, especially in the AFC, it's going to affect the playoff picture. Uh, Trubisky in Chicago, by all accounts, it seems like it's going to be Glennon's team. And then, you know, if, if Trubisky looks comfortable, maybe he takes it over sooner rather than later. If he looks uncomfortable, maybe we don't see him until the, you know, last quarter of the season like we saw with Goff or the second half of the season like we saw with Goff. And then with Kaiser, you know, kind of battling Cody Kessler and Brock Osweiler, uh, you know, want to see if, you know, Kaiser's going to get a shot at some point this season. But I think his preseason comfort level will kind of determine how early that really is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Your turn, Mike. What else? All right. You Back to me. To? I am looking forward to, and again, don't crucify me for this one, but the Jacksonville Jaguars. Will the pieces finally mesh? Every year they w- they've they've been w- killing the off season. Every year they've won the off season three straight off seasons. Never really seems to translate to the field, but I think they won it in such a handle so handily this off this year that something has to something's got to give. Basically, they, they have to improve. If you just look at that roster on paper, the defense especially. There's not there's not a lot of holes like there's not a lot of holes. There shouldn't be. But I mean, it's going to come down to Blake Bortles. Obviously, any sort of success they have this year. Is he the Blake Bortles of 2014, 2015, excuse me, or is he the one from either of his other two years of his career, which were just so bad that you can't win with a quarterback like that? Yeah, man, uh, you're right. I mean, we talked about this during draft season. If, if you were drafting or if you were mock drafting for Jacksonville at four overall, and you're one of those people that says, I need to find a need and give them a position of need. It was very difficult, and that's why you saw a lot of mock drafters saying, uh, I don't see any positions of real need, so we're going to give them O.J. Howard at four because they could use a tight end. But name-wise, that's the team that they've built. If you consider Dante Fowler a defensive end, former first-round pick, still you still need to see what he is. And they bring in Calais Campbell, and they drafted Miles Jack at linebacker. You have Jalen Ramsey in the defensive backfield, and they pay A.J. Boye to play on the other side. Uh, I know you wanted to give them another corner, but that's a whole different story because you can never have too many corners. I've talked about that too much already. It's all right. Let's keep it moving. You can never have too many corners. On paper, it does look really good. How will they mesh? I think, you know, they have to change the scheme up a little bit. You know, they they were running that straight Seattle cover one, cover three. Are they going to change it up a little bit more this year, or are they going to be, I don't want to use the word vanilla, but you know a little bit more standard like Seattle is, where they just say, hey, we're going to play this coverage and just try to play it really, really well. So I, I think there's a lot to see with Jacksonville on both sides of the ball, and yes, their success will ultimately come down to Bortles, but man, that defensive talent, they should be, should be improving here at some point. I, and I, I think the other... We, I touched on the defense and how really no holes there. The thing I want to see offensively is what are they running? I think what the best sort of scheme for them, if I had to pick another team scheme in the NFL for them to run, would be someone like the Tennessee Titans because you cannot put your quarterback, you cannot put Blake Bortles in obvious drop back situations where he might get pressured or Explain. he's just gonna he's just gonna throw the ball away. He, he's had I think he had five interceptions in a seven on seven period. 
uh, at practice yesterday. Okay, all right. Don't draw which, training which, camp stats on which, me. Which, okay, hey, uh, while that's not, you know, while I'm, I don't, again, training camp stats, if a guy's great at it, whatever. But on the bad end, if, if you're it's really playing bad, terribly, yeah, that's a bad again, it's another indicator that uh, five interceptions when there's no pass rush, not good. Can you do me a favor? Explain to our listeners, because I don't know that every one of our listeners is really familiar with the Tennessee Titans exotic smash mouth scheme, but you did a great piece on it last week where you just broke it down, and, and I know you watched it in depth. Give us what exactly is Tennessee doing offensively, and why do you think that's a really good fit for Jacksonville? Well, one, they're they're just incredibly run heavy. They they do not, you know, they don't give Marcus Mariota a ton of drop back attempts where he has to, you know, he's not in complete control of the game in terms of he's not asked to do everything for that offense, which that would be very helpful for Blake Bortles not to be in complete control of that offense. And then number two, what they do is they try to scheme him as much time as humanly possible, whether it's through play action passes, chipping defensive ends, leaving just, you know, seven guys in to block, max protecting. And then they have a lot of half field reads to where he's only looking at two guys. Uh, he's only looking at a route with two guys or three guys in it uh, and just doesn't have much to look at, much to process. Whereas, you know, you have a route with five guys going out. You have to read the coverage to find the right side to then find the right receiver. And there's this whole, you know, the whole progression is difficult to do in the NFL as uh, watching Blake Bortles play quarterback would prove. So uh, I, I just think they could they could. It would behoove them to simplify that offense a little bit. Jalen Ramsey, last year, rookie cornerback, down the stretch, played really outstanding. Nine pass breakups and two interceptions over the last five games. Nine pass breakups, two interceptions over the last five games. So, you know, early That's why I said that, that, that the defensive backfield could be darn good, but yeah. I really think they've added so much talent. It really could just come down to the fact that it's a little bit of a change of scenery, different voices, and then they mesh. And th- mm-hmm. for the fifth year in a row, I expect massive improvement from the <laughs> Jacksonville Jaguars. I- I'm going to stay on the defensive side for my third thing that I'm going to watch. And I know that preseason defense can be very, you know, they call it vanilla, and teams just run out there and they run their base defense and they don't do anything crazy. But I think that's why I want to see what the Denver Broncos are going to do defensively. If you follow Denver through the years, we know that defensively, obviously, they won the Super Bowl in 2015. Last year, I mean, one of the best defenses that did not make the playoffs in recent years. I, Mike, can you think of a defense? No. That, was that, that, that defense was still, it really wasn't, like you said, uh, I think you mentioned this on one of the podcasts last week. If they would have made the playoffs in the ASC, they probably had the best chance of anyone of beating the Patriots just because of how good that defense was. Right. And, and so like, that's how bad the offense was last year. Yes. Plus the AFC West, you know, I think in part the AFC West got better, but my point is defensively, the Broncos have been outstanding the last two years, but in previous years they were good, but not great. And when they were good, they were a little bit more of a zone heavy team and they're a little bit more conservative. I think what really turned them around was Wade Phillips, 2015 and 16, much more aggressive nature. They played a lot of man coverage. You got the numbers, what, fourth highest percentage of man coverage last year? Yes, last year, 48.8% of their snaps in man, fourth most. So now Wade Phillips is gone. He's to the he's off to the LA Rams, and Vance Joseph is the new head coach. And Vance Joseph's his last two stops, Miami last year and Cincinnati previously, zone heavy teams. They play a lot of cover two, they play a lot of cover six, basically, you know, softer zone type of type of uh, coverages. Miami last year play, played the fifth lowest percentage of man coverage. I'm just interested to see how much influence does head coach Van Joseph have on the defense. I think he I think he was saying during the offseason that they're going to, you know, stick to what they were doing before, but it, you know, most coaches like to implement their style. So I just want to know if they're going to take this outstanding Broncos defense, change it, make it a little different. And if that makes them take a bit of a step back, even though they're still very talented. Yeah, I pegged them when we did the AFC uh, win totals for a fairly large regression defensively because of one. I don't think you could get much better than Wade Phillips scheme for the talent they have. I thought it perfectly suited, you know, what they did, what, you know, the talent that they had on all three levels. I thought it was perfect schematically sort of the play calling that sort of aspect was great. So any sort of changes to that. I think makes it a little worse. Like you said, if you play more zone, I don't think that's playing to their strength. So I think it would be a little worse. And then you look at injury luck. 
very healthy team last year outside of obviously Demarcus Ware, who's now not on the team anymore. So I, there's not really a spot where they're getting better. I, I, if you can pinpoint any place on the defense they're getting better, uh, let me know because I can't find one. And then at that point, if you're not getting better in the NFL, usually you're going to get worse. Injury luck's going to strike the other way. So I, I just don't see any way that this Broncos defense has you, you know the same teeth it had in the last two years. And, and the AFC West, again, continues to get better. Your darlings, the L.A. Chargers, you've mm-hmm. got the Chiefs. Ah who were the number two seed in the AFC just last year. And of course the Raiders who, if Derek Carr doesn't get hurt down the stretch are, you know, maybe in the AFC championship game, you know, they're making a run offense, offense is good. Defense is getting better. So tough AFC West. Uh, it's going to be tough for Denver to compete in the AFC West. And again, it's preseason, but I just want to see, you know, you, you could tell what the base coverages are going to be in preseason. So I do want to see what Denver looks like defensively no yeah you're not alone i'd love to see it that's probably my third we go one two oh no that was i was those my two offenses that's probably my top defense there we go with a ranking top who i want to see in terms oh, of who i want to see i got you yeah. any other big storylines or rookies in particular you want to watch leonard fournette see how he's handling the jacksonville offensive scheme since we're you know you brought up the browns come on the 49 i know that's why i said like people the are jaguars <laughs> gonna be like are you crazy but i think i mean there's something to be said for finding the next team to come up and you know, I think one of those three will be within the next three years making the playoffs. I should, I would hope. So I want to identify which one it is now, so I can, like the Chargers, jump on the bandwagon early next year. Yeah, so you can point back to I said that three years yep. ago. That yeah, that's putting that's yourself helpful. way out on a limb that one of these three teams will be in the playoffs at in some three, point yeah. in the next three years, Mike. Wow, I really did. Is that my hot take of the week? That is the most play the, play the siren. <laughs> the most lukewarm take that Mike has ever had. Yeah, yikes. I feel bad about that now. Your boy, Leonard Fournette. But guys, look, it's preseason action. Uh, We hope you guys stay with us all season. We have some great things planned on the podcast. We're going to be doing uh, all of our AFC, NFC predictions. We're going to go team by team, breaking down what we think for the season soon. Our boy Sam is moving over to the States this very week. That's why he hasn't been on. So we can uh, can have a nice welcome. I think everybody should give him a welcome on Twitter, at PFF underscore Sam. Just go and tweet at Sam and just say, you know, give him your welcome to the U.S. tweet, however you want to do that. I don't know if you, you know, you've got some, you know, Uncle Sam shirts and some red, white, and blue pictures and GIFs or GIFs. But welcome Sam to the States. He'll be with us very shortly, becoming a Cincinnatian like Mike and I. Mm -hmm. That'll do it for us today. PFF Podcast, short and sweet, talking about exactly what we want to see as preseason action starts. It is Hall of Fame week. Don't forget, you guys have a chance to win the unbelievable new PFF product called PFF Elite, a $200 product that is available for free. You can win it if you leave us a five-star review. You can win it for free if you leave us a five-star review. Leave your Twitter handle or an email address so that we can get in contact with you if you are the lucky winner. If you don't want to do that, please go check out profootballfocus.com backslash subscriptions. Our PFF Edge product is absolutely vital for you for your fantasy drafts. It's all about Edge and Elite, only two products here. And whether it's fantasy football, whether it's NFL draft info, whether it's player grades, It's all there for you, so get ready for your fantasy drafts with PFF Edge and put yourself in the running to win a free PFF Elite. Don't forget what we talked about earlier, that playdraft.com or draft in the App Store. Use the promo code PFF because that is the future of fantasy football. For Mr. Mike Renner at PFF underscore Mike, I am Steve Palazzolo at PFF underscore Steve, and we'll talk to you guys later in the week.